put an apostrophe in your name? Last name? Yeah, you're O. Yeah, uh, O'Brien. I, I usually leave it out because it can mess with databases. <laughs> I found that That's, over the years. That would be why I'd leave it in. Yeah. Did you expect to be interviewed for a podcast this morning? No, did not. Had no clue about this, but right. well, I'm always game. All right. This is the this is the, the exchange for your free entry in the <laughs> GERCON. Appreciate it. All right. So let me give you the background here. Okay. This summer, somebody gave me a pitch that I didn't think it was very impressive about how to get underrepresented populations into technology, particularly kids who kind of grow up where we grew up, right? Yes. Sort of maybe in the, the little further to the east, we were kind of in the hood burbs as kids. Yes. Uh, not quite, not quite the hood, but mm, pretty damn close. We had some gangs. We had some gangs. Yeah. yeah. Mad Av represent. <laughs> but, but so like... I was thinking, man, the, the people I know who do come from underrepresented populations, I don't know as they would say, like, if you gave my 10th grade teacher an Arduino and, and 10 minutes of training, if that would have been the thing that got me fired up and interested in tech. So, if you would, state your name for the record. Gotcha. Thurston O'Brien. All right. And what do you do now in as far as you're allowed to disclose that? Uh, currently, I do IT for, for the government and uh, basically uh, protect networks. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. And then... How did you become interested in doing exactly that? Uh, let me see. I, I've been doing IT for quite a few years. Did it on the civilian side for a, a long time. Actually, if you go back over 20 years, actually, it started off with growing up around here, and we always messed around with computers, and you yourself had the Commodore 64, and actually one of our good friends, Matt, had the Commodore 64 and was always playing around with that. Who we have agreed to have drinks with at some point. It, yeah, anyways. exactly. We exactly. Um so we, we always had computers and the Ataris and stuff like that. And then later on, I actually wound up being an electrician for the Navy for five years working on aircraft and uh, working on some of the components. And then later on when I got out, I actually went into hotels. And while working at hotels, I jumped on being kind of the on-site computer guy for replacing systems. And I started basically all my past experiences led me back up into that. And then, of course, when I started doing that and managing the network that was at that hotel, I started realizing, you know, there's really good money in this. And, you know, I've been surrounded and absorbing all this stuff for all these years since I was really young. You know, time to start doing something with it. And it just kept rolling and rolling. And it was kind of weird because every time I would do something else, it would always pull me back. And, of course, the... Uh, it's like Godfather 2. Yeah. It did pull me back. Yeah. <laughs> it did. It did. And the other thing was just that the making a livelihood at it, it's, it's the best thing on the market out there. If you go to the right spot, you can make a really good living for yourself and for your family. For sure. For sure. So I wonder how much of that has, has like changed with the times. You know, like in the 80s, early 90s, like computers were this brand new thing that nobody had access to and I, I wonder with like the ubiquity of of cell phones and and computers like if kids aren't quite as like ooh, check this out it's just kind of like everybody's got one of these in their pocket and they're flipping through the tactics uh, definitely and actually one of my other influences even more big would would have to be that um, you know since we, we grew up playing rpgs and games and all that kind of stuff by the, the way there's some battle tech pods over there uh, yeah that are just dope i know so i mean we grew up playing cyber gen cyberpunk was huge yep. and all basically all that stuff that's going on in, from all those games is stuff we currently have in existence or are in the process of making for sure like the the the, I saw an article the other day that talked about like just how wrong Star Trek was about the future of technology and mm -hmm. the places like if we got flying cars we'd we'd have exceeded everybody's expectation. Exactly hasn't exactly worked out. Although I have hopes for like quadcopter related like personal vehicles. Well, I mean the, these iPhones are actually I mean they're the closest thing to a tricorder you got out there on the market. For real, for real, it's pretty awesome. So like I know the answer to this, but pretend like I don't. So like, yeah. what was your relationship with technology as a kid? Okay. We, I mean, I mean, when we were kids, we couldn't afford anything. Where we were growing up, we, we really, right. I mean, you kind of had to beg, borrow, steal, and then you you actually saw other people with a lot of stuff. Where we had friends who had some of that stuff. Yeah, for for the historical purposes, we were both students at Immaculate Heart of Mary Catholic School, which is colloquially known as <laughs> IHM stands for I Have Money, and. And we were definitely on the I don't have money end of that spectrum. Yes. So being the poor kids at the rich kids school <laughs> wasn't always great. Although they educated the hell out of me. So They, they did. They did. I, I, I'm always appreciative of that. And the, the discipline actually 
really helped for my military career later on. <laughs> Being, <laughs> having, having Sister Sheila wrap you in the knuckles oh, yeah. where the ruler prepared you for ba- boot camp. But like, so like, what was your relationship with technology, like, like borrowing and stealing? I may have done some of the latter. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it. I mean, it was probably we got. Well, okay, so at IHM, I mean, we had computer class in school in elementary, which was really big back in those days. I remember they they exchanged recess yes. for computer time if I behaved myself. Yes, and they, they had those programs where you were being a rock star and writing songs and trying to make a living. Oh, yeah, man, rock. Yeah, yeah. Rock, load, <laughs> quote, rock dot something, quote, comma eight, comma one, boom. And then uh, that was like my first hacking too. Like I, I changed the lyrics to the songs and I made them say horrible and offensive things. <laughs> I didn't remember that. Yeah, you you actually got into that a lot more. Um, it, well, okay, so <laughs> Monopoly too. I pork place. I'm oh. not going to tell you what else I changed some of those names to. <laughs> well, I remember. Let me see. The other thing in technology. I mean, we always we always did a lot of stuff. Well, as we got older in elementary school, of course, our friends, you know, hacking into the possibly possibly adjusting our attendance records and That's perhaps our grades too. The statute of limitations. <laughs> don't recall any such goings on <laughs> i think i think it's, it's been over 20 years we're okay now what's your what's your experience like so i guess you you covered that like your educational experience with relationship to it to cyber to yeah well a lot of i, I think a lot of things was getting technology and getting things to work in our favor getting it to do what we wanted it to do for us that that was the big thing i mean when we needed to do something how could we tweak things modify things or change things so we could get it to do what we, we needed it to do. Which is, to my mind, like the essence of surviving in the modern world. Yes. Can, one of the things I'm, I'm really focused on, I teach a, a, you know, I teach basically intro the first two years of, of computer science or cybersecurity yes. curriculum. So lots of times I'm taking people from, and I do some professional training where I'm taking people from like zero to hero. Yeah. And like just establishing that efficacy where you feel comfortable clicking on something and you're not terrified that it's going to blow up the computer when you double click the icon or something is super important it's it's huge definitely interesting all right so if if you were trying to change this conference from a collection of primarily white dudes yeah middle-aged looking like we should have all probably taken part in the 1k run this morning (laughs) and we decided not to yes like what program do you think might increase like the the diversity of of this group if you can imagine one yeah actually or get kids like us inspired about technology there's i mean today honestly i would talk to i mean we are always interesting in gaming and rpg going to some of those groups because some of those groups have some diverse backgrounds with some of them and all of them love reading and doing stuff like that. And one of the big things about all the, my gaming stuff was I, I also got into tech and stuff because everything I did in those games, I wanted to make real or right. make a part of my life. And I think there's a lot of people that are in that, that you know, in those, some of the communities that would probably do it. And I know a lot of gamers that are from all kinds of backgrounds because we were from all kinds of backgrounds. The, so, the, I, have, I have hooked and pulled in gamers into my classes before, and the problem is often that like playing the games is fun writing the games suck (laughs) oh yeah that's true well so the other part of it is making sure that anything with the computer and the tech that you're showing the practical side Mm. a lot of it is you know places like these some of the big things would be you know setting up your home system or setting up your home system plus you know doing like this where you're the whole sound studio Mm. because I don't know any kid these days with technology. They want to be YouTube stars. Oh, yeah. Knowing how to set up their own home system, do that, and how, how to do a broadcast on it, I think you could hook a bunch of them as a, just a starting pad. That is definitely not a bad idea. We actually have a, a media class that uh, sometimes co-host mm-hmm. of this pod runs for the college. So Because all, all the kids these days want to be, I mean, they think. Or they, they want to they be they Twitch do, streamers. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they think that they're going to make a million bucks after they get, you know, a couple lucky hits. So doing something like, hell, you could hook just a ton of kids on that. Not, not bad thoughts. Thank you. So if, if you could go back. To, you yep. were on Silver, right? Yeah, Silver Street. Silver next to the train tracks. Right across the street. Right up from like <laughs> right up from Alto. We had that big sketchy field in the backyard of our place, but like I still to this day a train will go by and I won't notice. <laughs> if you could go back in time to, to your young self, probably standing next to my young self at that yep. point, what kind of advice would you give yourself in terms of career choices and, and I, I would I mean the main thing I would probably say to myself is, you know, as, as a young kid I, I you know did a lot of stuff, but I was terrified of a lot of stuff. Just, you know, it gets better, and 
<laughs> and just keep absorbing as much as you can. I know it's really scary, and there's so much that's going on in the world, and you're afraid of so many things, but it gets better. And the more you know over time as you start to absorb it, it'll get a lot better. That is that is the advice a friend of mine was telling me about coming out. <laughs> it gets better. Don't worry. When you're an adult, it's way better. All right, man. The world's so, a scary place. It is. Man, I don't know. I'm just dumb, I think, is what's going on. I, I never, I always, like, it wasn't until I grew up that I learned to be appropriately afraid. <laughs> like, I barreled through the first 20 years of my life thinking I was indestructible. Or that I'd be dead and it was not a big deal. Same here. Yeah. Same here. Well, yeah, we did lots of dumb stuff when we were kids. It's amazing we actually survived that stage. Yeah, like, I would... I can't imagine the aneurysm my wife would have if, like, our kids, if my kids ran alongside a freaking train and jumped on it. Like, she would, or she would have a stroke, like, literally right there. Oh, right. Definitely. Or I, I tell my wife about when we used to play ball tag, and, you know, we were the youngest of the kids, and we would be on rooftops, and yeah. you would, like, peg someone and knock them off of a roof. <laughs> oh, the good old days. And yet, most of us survived with no broken, seriously yeah. broken bones. Yeah. Right, and I think those were all the questions. It's always great seeing you. So please say and spell your name for the nice people. Okay. My name is Sophie Blanchard, S-O-P-H-I-E, Blanchard, B-L-A-N-C-H-A-R-D. Okay. Are you named Sophie because of wisdom? Because it was the name of Jack Aubrey's first sailing vessel and then later his wife in the Aubrey and Maturin series or for some other reason? You know, I really wish it was the second one. You like naval I, historical fiction? I I like naval historical fiction. I wouldn't say that it's like my go-to, you know, type mm-hmm. of uh, genre. Okay. But, but were you aware that Jack, so Master and Commander with uh, like, what's his face? That movie from uh, several years ago is based on a series of novels called the Aubrey and Maturin series and Aubrey's first boat and then later his spouse is both named Sophie. I think it was actually because of the wisdom thing, but... Oh. So I ask because that's what I named my daughter, and all of those things were involved in her being named Sophia. You know, I really wish my parents had considered that. Just pretend. I it's, will pretend. It's, yeah, just, just lie. It's when fine. I was a little kid, I used to want to be named Rachel, and now now I'm glad that... You because know, of friends? I don't know. Rachel just seemed like a cool name. All right. All right. So... Uh, Rachel, tell me about tell me about what you do right now. It sounds like you just you're just getting your feet wet in this industry. Yeah, so I'm an internal account manager for NCC Group. Okay. So my day to day consists of a bunch of different things. So I'm prospecting for my company. I'm coming up with client vulnerability roadmaps to help different clients kind of navigate how they're gonna bolster their security framework and protect their assets. Got you. Gotcha. And then what got you interested in that line of work? What seems like? So I kind of fell into the cybersecurity industry on accident, which I think is a kind of a way that a lot of people yeah, end you up get in this lot. industry. For sure. But I, I did an interview with my company, and I, during the first interview, I was like, I, I know I want to work for this company. I know that this is where I need to be. And over the course of five months I just I fell so in love with the industry I I always knew that I wanted to be in an industry where I was protecting people that's what I cared about the most I wanted to be able to do something where I was actively protecting people and in cybersecurity, we have the ability to protect people every day when we go to work we are all here to defend somebody was saying in the keynote speech yesterday so so far what do you like and then what do you dislike about this business this scene as some people call it what do I like I like that everybody that comes here, everybody that comes to these conferences is all working towards a common mission. We all want to make the world a more secure place, and we're all actively trying to seek out new tactics, techniques, and procedures that are going to help bolster that that security. uh, Some of us just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. (laughs) Some of us definitely just want to watch the world burn. No, I'm kidding. Usually you're right. Like Most of the people here are, are definitely proactive defender types. The, the So, like, what was your relationship with technology like? As I mentioned, you you are you have the same name as my daughter and are probably just a few years younger than me. Just a couple to, to, to guess. I'm only 26, so. But your relationship 
with technology as a kid was probably like vastly different from from the old gray hairs because for us computers were like this new and exciting thing and I have to imagine you grew up in a world where like a computer was just that thing your parents were doing their taxes on yeah. and you had a supercomputer in your pocket from as soon as you could chalk your parents into doing it well I would say that I was never really like a very tech savvy person but saying that I wasn't a tech savvy person when when I'm generation Z is very different than somebody saying they're not a tech savvy person for generation say X mm -hmm. because for me from the get-go, I was always surrounded by technology. I was always surrounded by cell phones, even though I watched them evolve throughout. I'm 21 years old, so throughout 21 years, right. I watched them evolve. When did you get your first phone? I got my first phone when I was 9 or 10. Okay. I actually had a flip phone, and I lived on a golf course, and I would walk to golf lessons, and my parents wanted me to call them when I got to golf lessons. Oh, I got you. So the phone was locked. I could only call my parents... And oh, if only we could do that today. Right? And then I would walk across the golf course, try not to get hit with golf balls, <laughs> and then I'd call them. And then from there, I got a little slide-up phone, and I think I got my first iPhone 4 a couple years later. And from there, I've just had iPhones. But gotcha. for me, growing up with the technology, growing up going to elementary school and having computer classes. So well, that was going to be my next question. What was your re educational relationship with technology as you started up? When I was in third grade, we had something called computer camp that was mm. part of our curriculum for, for elementary sure. school. And we would, we would go into the computer lab and we'd have these typing lessons. And so for a week, they taught us how to type. And from there... I actually, so that was when I was in third grade. Mm -hmm. When I was in fourth grade, we had a math fair at school. And I, I didn't want to, like, make a poster. Like, I just didn't feel like it. And so I actually ended up writing a math rap. <laughs> do you remember your math rap? I do. Are and you my, willing to deliver your math rap? Maybe. I could deliver my one about 21st century history. I'm not going to stop you. No. Yeah, come on. You actually want to hear it? How long is this? It's, it's, it's very short. Is it 10 minutes or longer? No, it's like it's like 30 seconds. Okay. You Hit want, me. Okay. Do this. Right. This is radio gold is what, what okay. we're talking about right now. So it goes 21st century history. First we elected GWB. 21 million votes already decided. They were counted on the ones from Florida. But show problems in the INP and hope to bring peace to the Middle East. On 9-11, the Twin Towers went down by Afghanistan soldiers one by one. And then it's like... We sent troops out, not knowing if they were coming back. Gas prices soared. NASA got better than nature's power struck and created Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> Bravo. Yeah. Bravo. But I used to write these educational raps because I, I didn't want to create posters for class. I think we just figured out what your podcast is going to be. Thank you. Sophia's educational raps. Yeah. And Perfect. you so want to know the, the reason that I got involved with that is because I learned how to use GarageBand at school. Oh, no doubt. Everybody's favorite Apple make your own music kind of. Yeah. So I used to just go home. I'd go on my dad's giant, very thick at the time, desktop Mac. Mm -hmm. And then I would start mixing my own beats. <laughs> and then when I would figure out what the rap was going to be about, like after I'd write the, the lyrics. And I wrote one about Wetland Deer, too. Wetland deer. Yes, for for class because I had to I had to do a project about wetland deer. Okay. My mom would always be on my back tracks. <laughs> As vocals or? As vocals. Oh wow. Yeah. One of the reasons that I decided this time around I wanted to talk to folks who like if you look around this conference I don't know if you've noticed this but it's a collection of slightly overweight white dudes in their 30s and 40s and and I, I got a pitch over the summer for some thoughts on how to diversify that and I thought you know what I know a lot of people in this industry so I want to hear like how they wound up doing what they do but if you were so like your career path was essentially college first job landed in cyber thumbs up bonus yeah pretty much I mean I've always been a very driven person. When I was in high school, I was always a creator. So I created a Lighthouse Preservation Association, which, you know, when you first hear that, people are always like, why, why the hell does anyone need to preserve lighthouses? Oh, no, man. I'm, a, I'm a sailor. I appreciate the value of lighthouses. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, in the town that I grew up in, the lighthouse in my town actually brings in, like, a ton of revenue every summer. It's the most people photographed in lighthouse in the world. Which lighthouse did you go to? It's called Nubble Light. It's in Maine. It's in oh, southern okay, okay. Maine. And so I used to do all these little things to create. I spoke at March for Our Lives in New Hampshire in 2018. And when I went into college, I knew that I wanted to be, I was a, in my town in Maine, I was a 
a big fish in a small pond. Okay. But I wanted to be the biggest fish in the biggest pond. I wanted to push myself outside of my comfort zone. And ultimately, I wanted to surround myself with things that I had never experienced before. I wanted to diversify my knowledge. And I couldn't expect somebody else to teach me about that. I needed to educate myself. And so I moved to a city to be able to educate my things educate myself on things that had never affected me before that's wise that's wise so if if you were trying to envision some kind of program that could have got you interested in cyber and technology as a kid other than having a dad who let you use his computer to do garage band what do you think what would that have looked like was computer camp good enough to get you fired up in third grade about i think computer camp was good to be honest i i was having a conversation with my dad about this a couple months ago and i said I never thought that I was smart enough to go into tech. Nobody ever made me feel like I was smart enough to go into tech because I was always like the liberal arts, liberal arts type of person, but I was the person that was in Project Success Math, which is like the math for kids that can't do math. I had a math tutor starting in third grade. Hmm. I wasn't very good at science, and so I never thought that I was going to pursue a career in STEM. Mm -hmm. But what I always knew is that I love talking to people. I love pitching people. I love creating relationships with people, and I knew that that was what I was good at. And I started working for a startup, and the goal of the startup was to help underprivileged people that don't have as easy pathways to success find growing up on a in a golf course with a lighthouse nearby sounds like you might not have come from the hardcore streets of south maine no right and so that was kind of i i understood that i had a lot of privilege right and it's that's very precise use of language your generation does that much better than mine does so like i got a kid a year older than you so like he is he is equally aware of that i think that's one of the things that gives me hope yeah, and I I like to surround myself with people that are going to constantly be able to help me like expand my knowledge, but also check myself. Right. I always want to continuously become a better person. So, did you think those the both the like Code Camp and the program you worked with were an effective means to to creating that outcome that we're trying to talk about here, like a, getting a diversified peoples into into this business into STEM in general? I think so. To be honest, I think I think I, I learned how to figure out how to have confidence in myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I lived abroad for a little bit, and I think part of that was about learning what the things that I liked about myself and the things that I was really good at, my strengths and my weaknesses. But I have to give a ton of credit to my company because my company has helped me become super confident in myself and my abilities. And... When I was in my first week of training and I didn't know anything about cybersecurity, I was like, there's no way I'm going to survive past two weeks. I don't know how I got this job. I, I can't be in cybersecurity. I don't know anything about cybersecurity. And then I ended up, we had to do an MDR certification. Okay. And I was... What's uh, an MDR certification? Manage detection and response. Okay. I was one of the first people in my company to, like, I was the fastest person to get it. Wow. And I had no experience in cybersecurity. I ended up getting it my second week of training. Got you. So I may be looking at the answer to the question I'm about to ask you, but did you know someone or have you since found someone in the industry who's, who's serving as a mentor for you? I think I have so many mentors. I, I've, I've met some of the most amazing people. Every day I feel so lucky because I feel like I landed in a place where I'm surrounded by people that want to help me excel my career, but... We have a sales coach at mm-hmm. my at my company, yep. and he is constantly helping me expand my knowledge and become the best employee I can be. I'm always working in different departments because I have so many different interests. My manager has also been like a great mentor to me. She's actually we have mentors that we get set up with, and my manager is actually my mentor. Gotcha. So she's helped me from the very beginning. Her. That is not. No? That's actually just one of my coworkers. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Got you. So do you plan on trying to, to pay that forward? Have you done any mentoring? I realize you're early in your career and just starting out. I don't want to... I don't want to be like a, like a hypocrite. Like, I don't want to... 
be this early in my career and like say that I have all the answers because right. I don't I don't know if I'll ever have all the answers. Oh, trust me. Mm -hmm. But I do I do want to help people understand different pathways mm. because I I didn't know that this was going to be a pathway. I got recruited off of LinkedIn. Right. Hey, me too. I the, the I do a I do an adjunct teaching job for U of M and. They saw a good-looking profile, and I had checked all the yeah, boxes they needed. They and sent me a, a guy message called me. And they were like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna do like a first interview?" And I was shout like, out to LinkedIn. Yeah, shout out to LinkedIn. Oh, P.S. Thank you for just teaching the old guy how to do the little QR code scan on LinkedIn. I totally did not know that was a thing. See, that's just that's just Gen Z. There you go. To use technology. There you go. You just Even saw the button and the knew what it did. Even the most tech savvy person ever. Right. You couldn't write the app, but you could use the app. But oh, no, could you write the app? Could I write the app? Yeah. You think? No. Uh, Web apps aren't. You know what? I don't want to say that it can't do something because I think that. Fair. fair. I think that what I've one of the things that I've figured out. In could the last you do it five before months, next week Friday? No, I could not. <laughs> but I've realized that everything that I say I can't do. Uh -huh. If I if I work hard enough at it, most things that I feel like I can do. There you go. There you go. That is an awesome attitude to have. Is there any question that I should be asking people along these lines? Is there any question? that I didn't ask you that you think maybe I should have? I think I think the question that I always have going into conferences like this is why are you here? Why are you at this conference? But why are you in the industry? Mm -hmm. And what do you what is it that you want to accomplish? What is what is your mm -hmm. ultimate goal? Oh, that's a good question. What is that that you want to accomplish? I mean I think I think the overlying the overlying goal is that I just I just want to contribute and I want to to help critical industries be more secure. But I just I want to be an ally for companies to go to and to be able to utilize different services that are going to help them bolster their own network. But when you break that down even further, you know we've talked a little bit about like my interest in governance, risk, and compliance. And Which, th th that's a sentence you don't hear a hell of a lot of. Yeah. And that was kind of Let me was, tell you about my interest in GRC. <laughs> that was going to be one of my next points is like, not a lot of people have an interest in compliance, but... They do when, when the million dollar fine shows up. Then all of a sudden compliance is a big yeah, deal. Yeah, or they do when they realize that, like, it's going to be a lucrative opportunity. But that's not why I'm interested in compliance. I'm interested in compliance because it's over the, over the next couple of years or so... We're going to just watch compliance become something that's going to be of greater value because there's going to be more mandatory compliance requirements that are going to come about. We're going to see CMMC. That's going to be... That's the California... It's, it's, it's like a mandatory compliance requirement for suppliers and contractors working with the Department of Defense. Okay, okay. They have to have their certification by 2025. Or you can't do business with the Defense Department. Yeah. And you can't get those sweet, sweet contracts. And so we're going to see so many companies going through these mandatory compliance requirements. But the beauty of them is that they're, they're an initiative that's going to really force companies to take security to the next level even if even if that's not their first priority their 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 business driver is probably not like oh i'm trying to make my security network stronger it's probably i want to i want to work with the federal government or i want to work with the department of defense so i need to go through this gotcha and do you think that i i don't know if you caught chris's keynote yesterday but his point was that that he has something of a negative view of compliance his his the theme of his talk was tick in a box like a tick mark, not to be confused with other yeah. things that you can put in a box. He, he, and the industry in general, from my vantage point, and I'm I'm sort of a security dilettante. Like I teach this stuff. I don't have a business that tomorrow, if it is, blows up, I'm going to be working 48 hours to fix. His, uh, my perch from here seems to be like a lot of these guys don't take compliance very seriously. That they think it's just some check mark. That it doesn't really do anything for security. What do you say to guys who, who, like, have that, and it's almost all guys, who have that, who have that mindset? I think they have the wrong outlook on it. Yeah? I think that if you're looking at compliance and you're saying compliance is just a checkbox, it's just... It's that that just might have been literally the words he said <laughs> earlier. That, that it's just something that you're going through to, to, to meet a requirement. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not what it is at all. And this isn't like a me giving the federal government like a shout out. I'm not. I'm not. They, <laughs> shout out to the DOD. I'm not. I'm not getting sponsored by the Department of Defense. 
Well, but in a way, we all are. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But they're not like in my in my Instagram DMs right now. Going, <laughs> we're gonna give you like a fifty dollars Amazon gift card if you do this on the podcast. I just had this vision of Uncle Sam saying, "Hey, I'm gonna slide up in them DMs and give you a fifty dollars Instagram gift card." But compliance isn't just a checkbox. It's it's a way of making our country and the rest of the world safer mm. because when we start considering and really caring about supply chain issues and energy and automation and the automotive industries there's so many different industries that have critical components that can really affect humans with like this trickle down effect by going through these mandatory compliance requirements it's a step in the right direction it's not the it's not the the answer the end all be all answer where it's going to be like you have the best security framework ever wow you're you're going to be the poster child for for security frameworks but it's a step in the right direction got you got you i, I don't know if, if you're into like popular self help but there's a a guy atul gawande he's a he's a oncologist all around brilliant dude who wrote a book called the checkbook or check box uh, no the checklist manifesto and it it's all about research done at hospitals that how how out, health outcomes improved in hospitals because they adopted using a freaking checklist and as a as a sailor like i know i don't leave port without going through a checklist of things so i i'm sort of like subtweeting chris here but like i think that that by having those structures in place even if they're just a tick in the box it's still better than nothing, which is what we've got in a lot of these places. So at least somebody forced you to think about, yeah. you know, do we have our I firewall mean, set properly? Or have we ever looked at the CIS compliance the documents, guidance documents for our stuff? Yeah. I mean, first of all, subtweeting. There you go. That's a, that's Gen Z slang. Well, I, I hang out with the youngs. You I've, hang out I've with learned the, young, how the youngins. To, I've learned how to, be, how to be on fleek with the youngsters, and I dab at that. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, God. On fleek and... Are we not dabbing or fleeking anymore? I feel like those are terms that, like, Gen Z uses to make fun of people. Oh, damn it. Yeah. Those pesky students. But, no, going back to the, the compliance, the checkboxes, mm -hmm. you're right. It, it, it's, it's just a, it's a way of moving forward. And I think that... Oftentimes, there's a negative outlook on, on private companies. I was at a conference last week, and a lot of people want to work for the government because they want to be able to contribute. And you can, you can contribute through working for a private company. Private companies are coming up with the new tactics, techniques, and tactic, techniques, and TTPs. TTPs, thank you. That's what the old guys say. It would have just been easier to say TTPs. <laughs> but, this, thank you for using the words the first time, so in case yeah. our, our, our but, listeners don't. That research is going to help keep evolving the industry. This is an industry that can't stay stagnant without becoming obsolete. Mm. We are never going to just stop learning information. We always constantly have to expand our knowledge because things things become obsolete, and then we have to come up with new ways to do things. And these private companies are doing, doing the research. They're helping the government by being, like, third-party assessors for programs, initiatives, like, like FedRAMP, mm -hmm. for example. And FedRAMP is somebody in that when, when a company finds out that they're going to have to go through FedRAMP, and just for reference, FedRAMP is for software companies that are based in the cloud that mm -hmm. want to work with the federal government. When they find out that they have to have to go through FedRAMP, they're like, I have no idea what I'm going to be doing with this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to go through a 12 to 18 month project that's going to cost like five hundred to $700,000 and then we have to maintain it. But, but you do if you want to get those sweet, sweet government contracts. You do if you want to get those sweet, sweet contracts. Yeah. And in the process, you're going to be really bolstering your security. Right. You, you bring an interesting perspective to this because I think what you're describing is what sometimes the like very in-the-weed techie nerds don't understand or, or profess to understand but then say things like, it's not just a check mark. in that like we're there is no security for security's sake. Like We are all in service of either organizations or businesses that need defending and like those tick boxes matter to a lot of folks yeah Interesting. and i think that 
that is just another reason that that I want to be involved and I want to I want to have a stance. I think that like I really want to be an overlay between sales and technical people because I love having an ability to see both sides and I love going to conferences like this and being able to talk with technical people and expand my technical knowledge because we can have we can have better conversations when we understand who we're talking to and we understand the value to the person that we're talking to. Well said. Well said. Well, thank you very much for your time. I don't want to say I'm distracted, but like a guy dressed as a hazar with like a yeah. fez and a tassel just walked past. Yeah. That's the kind of industry you're getting yourself involved in. I should have dressed up better. You know? Well, if you cosplay, they will come. I don't even know why I would go as, though. <laughs> the kilts are popular. I did see that the kilts are popular. Yeah. Combat kilts. All right, well, thank you very much, Sophie. Yeah, thank it is, you. It, you. You, like, help me realize that the kids are all right, feeling a little better about the state of the world. Thank you so much. Of course. The Feasible Reasoning is produced at the Epic Studios of Grand Rapids Community College Media Technologies Department. Epically executive produced by Noah D. Smith and hosted by me, Drew Rosema.